my name is Robert Hill. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker today. So Dr. Karen Stout is here with us. And uh, first of all, I wanna say, I very much appreciate her joining us from three hours time zone difference and waking up so early in the morning to be with us and give us grand rounds this morning. Um, Dr. Stout is a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Washington. Um, in Seattle, and she is the Associate Chief of Cardiology at the University of Washington Medical Center in Seattle. Um, she did her training in Arizona in medical school and then went on to residency in internal medicine and her chief residency in Portland at the Oregon Health Science um, University, after which she moved to Seattle where she did her fellowship uh, in cardiology as well as her advanced fellowship in adults with congenital heart disease in Seattle and has stayed on there. And Dr. Stout is really a leader in our field of adults with congenital heart disease. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about the guidelines, and she's the first author of the, the newest guidelines that came out in 2018 um, for adults with congenital heart disease, which were published through the ACC and the American Heart Association. Um, Dr. Stout is a wonderful leader in this field. She's the kind of person that you want to listen to in conference, then go out with after conference and spend some time with. And um, I appreciate her being here today. I was, I was telling her that we've had uh, some wonderful cross-pollination going on um, between the Yale Congenital Heart Program and the Seattle Program, um, sending some fellows there to train, hiring some of their faculty. So I think this is another step along that pathway. And I very much appreciate her being here, being here today, and I look forward to her talk. So Karen, it's all yours. Uh, Rob, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And I'm definitely looking forward to the cross-pollination from Yale to Seattle, um, University of Washington. And thanks everybody for joining. Um, uh, it sounds like a lovely day um, in New Haven. And um, yeah, Zoom makes things really kind of handy, but it'd be obviously much better to actually be there in person. Um, so I am going to, there we go. Um, these are, there's just gonna be some interspersed pretty pictures for no seemingly good reason. Um, Zoom, has been super helpful and hopefully you can pop up on chat if anything starts coming across wrong. Um, I am going to start with just the basic case of Michael. Michael's a pretty representative adult congenital heart disease patient. Um, 32 year old, has tetralogy of Fallot. Um, he comes to see us in pretty routine visit. Um, he occasionally has some palpitations, worse during the pandemic, um, and doesn't feel as in shape, but he had recently got a new job. He's got two young kids. And so he just chalks that up to the fact that he's not exercising as much and getting older at 32. Um, his history is that he had a blood lactose on a shunt at age six months, um, which is not necessarily the characteristic repair that you get now. Um, but he was shunted and went on, underwent a complete repair at age two years. His pediatric cardiologist followed him until he went off to college at age 18, when Michael sort of was like, forgot, didn't really realize how important it was to continue to follow up with cardiology and got on about his business and had moved, gotten established with a new primary care provider a couple of years ago, who'd seen some of our various pitches to the community about adult congenital heart disease and referred him to us um, for ongoing follow-up. So just as a refresher for folks who don't do congenital heart disease and have sort of run into tetralogy of Fallot, but basically like when they took their board. Um, so the primary features of tetralogy of Fallot are going to be looking at, or at least one that's going to dictate um, the severity of disease, is going to be the, um, the severity of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There's a VSD, and then RV outflow tract obstruction that'll be at the pulmonary valve, subvalvular level, or even out in the branch PAs, or all of the above. And in very rare cases, none of the above, which is a very different physiology. There's a compensatory hypertrophy that makes up another of the features of tetralogy. Um, and then an overriding aorta and do the kind of trunkal imbalance there in terms of the size of the PAs and the aorta. So the net effect is that babies born with this are cyanotic and they're cyanotic for um, inadequate pulmonary blood flow and because of um, the VSD shunt across to the aorta. So early on, there wasn't an open cardiac repair, cardiac surgery. Um, was not a thing until the 1950s and 60s, and really not a thing until for everybody until sort of the 1970s and 80s. Um, so the initial effort was a palliative repair, courtesy of Blaylock, Tuscan, Thomas, 
um, of the left subclavian artery to the left pulmonary artery um, ligated so that you could have increased pulmonary blood flow. You're sort of bypassing that RV outflow tract obstruction, getting some blood into the PAs to oxygenate, and at least had the effect of increasing oxygen saturations for the child and allowing them to grow. So those were palliative procedures and arguably almost everything in adult and general heart disease is fundamentally palliative because it is not curative. Um, even when repaired, this person still has a tetralogy of fallot, which is sort of the foundation of our field, is that these are not repaired issues per se, or sorry, they're not cured issues. So after the shunt, he went on to have a more complete repair, closing the VSD patch and opening the RP outflow tract. And I'm going to show you some more details about that in upcoming slides. So here's an echo for Michael. And for those of you who read echoes, LV looks pretty good here on the sternal view. Um, RV looks like it's probably a bit big, um, and it is. Um, this is a VSD patch, and in the words of one of my very hilarious and echo mentors when I was a fellow, he said, uh, it's a VSD patch, and the way you can tell is that unlike you, it's thin and bright. Um, he was kidding, I swear. Um, right ventricle over here is big and squeezes a bit um, well, probably, maybe not. You know, echo and RVs, if you read them a lot, there's a whole lot of subjectivity in there, but it certainly doesn't look um, substantially decreased. And if you look over here, he's got kind of an unusual uh, anatomy in the sense that he actually has pulmonary valve leaflets here, um, which is one of the ways he's um, dodged having any other procedures done over this time is he was able to have fundamentally a valve sparing repair, which is uncharacteristic of tetralogy. Uh, usually, as we're going to get to, there isn't really much in the way of valve tissue, and patients are left with wide open pulmonary regurgitation. So if you look at the color and you look at the Doppler, you'd say his, his PR is somewhere between um, mild and severe. <laughs> pulmonary regurgitation by echo is rather challenging in many cases to actually accurately grade and we're going to come up on the relevance of that here in a little bit as well. Um, he does not have an appreciable amount of pulmonary stenosis, but he does have some, and then doesn't have any other alpha tract obstruction along his branch PAs or subalveolar. So overall, he seems to be doing pretty well. Um, he is, he has a lot of questions. He's a, he's a curious guy. He's an engineer. Um, why do I have to do everything? And what is it about that leaky valve? It makes him nervous. Um, if he is going to have to have anything done to that surgery, catheter-based procedure, how often does he actually have to see me or see anybody? And now that he has kids, he has some of those deeper questions about, am I going to live as long as everybody else? What should I be expecting from my heart? Uh, I want to be around for my kids. Is that going to be what I should expect? So for those of us who do adult and general heart disease, we have different options. For those of you who don't do it very often in the Skylands in your pra practice, you can go old school and go for books, which uh, anymore in my office seem like they're more decorative than anything because anytime I need an answer and I grab a textbook, I go to up to date. Um, there's always the phone and looking at various whatever sites you can find, adult congenital heart association, anything that kind of gives you some guidance. Um, and there is the guidelines and the guidelines really are intended to be certainly a um, starting point or integral part of the management of any adult with congenital heart disease. And so anything that I talk about with the guidelines here really is representative, although I was the chair, of a phenomenal group of people who are all expert and have subspecialty expertise within adult congenital heart disease. Uh, thankfully, when I started in adult congenital heart disease, that, that was niche, weird, and subspecialty enough. And as Rob can attest now, now that we have all these, um, it's a bigger field, now you have to be a subspecialist within adult congenital heart disease in some form, kind of in academic centers in particular. So this particular group represents a very um, broad array of experiences, including some with pediatric cardiology training, uh, EP, interventional cardiology, heart failure, the whole like, there's one non-ACHD person in that entire group. So what I wanted to reflect back for folks is I had a huge um, sort of awakening of sorts with guidelines and um, how I interpret and interact with guidelines now, having gone through the process of being the chair of this. And in full disclosure, I got to chair these guidelines without ever having been on a writing committee. So it was sort of directly into the boiling water of, of the guidelines without having had much in the way of, of a warm up. So I think some of the, the lessons that I learned since they were fairly um, yeah, acute. Um, 
have really stood out to me and they've influenced how I, I react, treat other guidelines, treat things that look like guidelines but aren't. Um, and so I'm gonna share a fair bit of that uh, through this talk today. So I'm gonna talk some about the process, the content, and then the people. So, and this is, you know, everybody loves a good top 10 list and I'm gonna roll with that. So serving on the committee really did influence how I apply and interpret guidelines and scientific statements. So this is the basic process of the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology recommendations when you're setting up guidelines. And they are, this is a process that is mirrored in a lot of different places. Um, so you get your writing committee together. You have to have, the majority of people cannot have any relation to industry. Um, and then you're gonna go through and instead of the easy way to do guidelines is to like throw out a bunch of, oh, this is what we should talk about. Here's the recommendations. Let's go find the data to support it. And this process deliberately wants to do the opposite of that. Let's not take the way you do things and then have you go support it with data because that's not really guidelines. That's how we practice, but that's still not necessarily the way you should do it. So in this case, there's a very deep dive into all the available data, making these data supplements. And then from that, recommendations are developed. There is also, as I'm gonna, her, I kind of mentioned a couple of times, um, a parallel process that the AHA ACC does of having a completely separate firewalled writing committee that is doing um, evidence reviews that are very, very detailed um, reviews that are addressing questions that the guidelines committee uh, believes really kind of don't have either enough data one way or the other to make any clear recommendations or are of significant importance that uh, this separate committee um, does a very deep review in that space and then gives us recommendations, gives a, that data back to the writing committee who then incorporates it as necessary or as able in the guidelines themselves. Um, there are several group document, I mean, several group meetings, those were highly entertaining. Document gets finalized and sent for review. And this is one of the things I really want to emphasize as being a distinction between scientific statements as an example and um, the guidelines is we've gone through, you spend all this time learning the language of the two A's, saying something is reasonable or can't be useful, uh, what level of evidence, so A, B, C, um, and go through and you try to really set your recommendations and then the appropriate level of evidence as justified by all of those data supplements. Um, and then it gets sent out for review. And in this case, we have 46 reviewers and 3000 comments. And that's really where the the chair steps in is the chair does two things. One is at the end of this process um, has to address in writing each of those 3000 comments um, and incorporate them into the guidelines when appropriate and necessary and respond. Yes, we respect your perspective. And that's not, you know, no, we can't do that because this, but every one of them has to be responded to in writing. It was, it was a stretch. Uh, the other thing we have to do, which is <laughs> represented by the upper left corner of this slide, is manage people's conflicts. So there's the obvious one of folks who happen to, you know, have relations with industry and are, are firm believers in, in trust them or something along those lines. Um, on the other hand, there's also the more subtle ones, which is that, you know, catheterizers like to catheterize and nothing heals like stainless steel. So trying to modify some of those perspectives of cath versus surgery, for example, or procedure versus medicine. Um, we thankfully had a really, a ACHD is rarely dogmatic about that sort of thing in terms of um, procedural interests, but we, you're, one of the things you have to do as chair is, is modify that. And the other is you have to temper the very loud voices in the room so that they don't squash, the more dominant voices don't squash the less uh, dominant voices in the room and make sure everybody is heard, especially when you're getting into opinion related things. So the differences that I learned, I had the opportunity to do two different things. One was an AHA scientific statement on chronic heart failure and congenital heart disease that I chaired, which we had so much in it, we ended up splitting it into two different um, statements. One on, uh, separated out on transplantation mechanical circulatory support, because that is a single document and so just too massive. And one of the things that came up with this was the, the committee had, had the desire initially to say, oh, well, I think we can make a couple of recommendations based on this. And right around then I got tied into the guidelines and I was like, you know, you just can't do this. We only have three reviewers for that scientific statement um, and not 46. And it doesn't have that same process. 
So one of the things that I really learned is I love scientific statements. I think they're great and they're great in particular because they can be more boundary pushing. Um, the guidelines are not boundary pushing. The guidelines are what is the state of our data right now um, and when you're writing it, or at least <laughs> antecedent to when you're writing it. And they are now done in a chunk format that allows them to be revised in real time. You can just take small pieces and revise them as you as data comes along. Um, but the scientific statements really don't have that same process or the same vetting. So if you are looking at those, I don't think it's unreasonable for some of those things to have recommendations, but I do think it's worth remembering or knowing that the, the degree to which they're vetted is dramatically different. Um, and the degree to which there is a process built around explicitly making recommendations is very different. So scientific statement versus actual AHA, CC guidelines, um, they're just different. And I feel like they serve different roles um, in, the, in the armamentarium for taking care of patients. The scientific statements definitely have a more educational bent to them as well. Current iterations of guidelines took a lot of that out reasonably so. Um, the other thing that just kind of remind everybody is ACHD is not all that uncommon. I was actually talking about this a bit with my father-in-law yesterday and he's a cardiologist and he's, he's retired, sort of retired. He's actually still working in his eighties, but doesn't interact with ACHD at all. He's like, oh, has it really gotten that common? I was like, yeah, it has. Um, so 1% of babies are born with congenital heart disease, and of those, 25% have a critical life-threatening defect, easily the most common type of birth defect. Um, and despite the frequency of that, and if you look at the pediatric cardiology or, or pediatric cardiac surgery, pediatric heart programs, they are robust for that number of babies, which is fantastic because that has uh, netted plenty of adults with congenital heart disease. But if you look back as to, you know, why, why does it seem like such a small field? Um, it is it has really grown only as cardiac surgery has been able to have an influence on the actual structural heart disease and as the cardiology support, anesthesia support, ICU support has allowed babies and children to survive some of those procedures. So first congenital heart surgery back in 1938, the first um, open heart surgery in 1954 in Minnesota, uh, the first ACHD program in order to train physicians uh, was started in 1976 in Los Angeles. And then the very first set of guidelines were in 2008, um, done by the ACC AHA. Um, early in the 2000s, there started to be a lot more interest from ACC AHA to some fairly prominent adult and general cardiologists really saying, hey, you know, we need to, this is a legit specialty, we need to start um, having the, the communication education, the guidelines, the everything that other specialties have. Um, and in 2015, ACGME recognized ACHD training programs of fellowships. Um, and then the first ABIM board exam was done at the same time. These things run in parallel, but not by the same organization. And this is actually old. There's far more fellowship spots now in the U.S. Um, but there will be um, a large number of adults turning into our babies born with congenital heart disease, and 90% of those will survive to adulthood. So there is a continued growth of these patients. And in the, in the old days, if you will, back in the 80s, um, if you look at this chart on the left, I'm um, looking at the age of death, um, and the black line is the general population. Back even as, as recently as the 1980s, um, people born with congenital heart disease had a, a unfortunate tendency to die um, at younger ages quite frequently. And now that age of death looks a whole lot more like the uh, population curves in general. And that was only just by the early 2000s. Um, that has netted us more adults than children living with congenital heart disease in the US and in most industrialized countries that have congenital heart treatment strategies, um, which is Europe, uh, North America, um, parts of Asia. And there's a huge increase, and this is an old slot, I mean, old data, but a huge increase in the number of hospitalizations. Um, and at our program, we have a fairly large program in Seattle. We had 650 hospitalizations last year for adult congenital heart disease related things. Some of those are procedures, um, and some of them were, uh, many of them were symptomatic. Um, so the idea of, of adult congenital heart disease being rare is not true. So there's about over a million and a half adults with congenital heart disease in the United States, and that grows annually due to the stunning and robust success of pediatric cardiac treatments, so diagnosis and treatments. 
So pediatric cardiology and pediatric um, heart surgery really deserve an enormous pediatric critical care anesthesia, uh, enormous credit for, for everything they've been able to do to have adults now surviving in, with congenital heart disease and doing well. So jumping a little bit to um, your, um, the idea of data um, and the data is supposed to drive the recommendations and you're supposed to really minimize the number of expert opinions. So we had a lot of wrestling back and forth and the slide got a, a little goofy, um, but you gotta know your audience. Um, so when is silence worse than no opinion at all? Uh, or when is silence worse than an expert opinion? So having no opinion being um, worse than saying something even if it's expert opinion that doesn't have a lot of data. So we really tried to find a balance for that. Um, and if you look at why we did that, and that was something that came back in those 3,000 comments, periodically was, you know, that's an expert opinion, that's an expert opinion. And particularly for people who don't do ACHD, some really responded positively, but some did not. 95% um, of general cardiologists are going to see ACHD patients, and fewer than 10% of ACHD patients are seen by ACHD cardiologists. So the vast majority of the patients who have ACHD are going to be seen by people who are not specifically doing a lot of adult congenital heart disease or are not um, otherwise uh, connected with an ACHD program, as an example. And, and when we think about that in, in different, you know, kind of not, it's not, there's some places where you're know, like, oh yeah, that happens, heart failure, a lot of heart failure is treated by primary care providers and not by cardiologists or not by advanced heart failure uh, cardiologists. But the more unusual the disease, the more people really are like, whoa, I don't know what that is, let's funnel them to the right specialists. But the grim reality is we don't have enough of those specialists. And we just don't have enough ACHD cardiologists, 350 to 400 nationally, who are board certified. So if you look at your audience here, um, on the right side are gonna be our ACHD experts. So those will be the folks who do this a lot, if not all the time, who may or may not have been trained in it. It's a new enough specialty that many folks did not do explicit training in it, but they got the on-the-job training similar to advanced percolator transplant from the mid-2000s. Um, so the guidelines actually do, are intended to try to help the expertise. Um, and in my case, not only is it folks from Yale, but the far picture there is Eric Krieger, one of my um, partners. So somehow or another, these guidelines have to satisfy him. And I will tell you, they did not. Did not in many cases at all. Um, so this is a group of people who hear hoof prints uh, or hoof, hoof beats, and they know, eh, ACHD, it's, those are horses. We're, we're good with that. We're familiar with that. But on the far side here, those people who are hearing hoof beats and are like, what is that? Um, you get either the zebras or the horbers. If you haven't seen a horse, that's some hybrid zebra horse, which just seems like that would be awesome to have. And yet also kind of wrong. Um, so here's this whole other array of people who may interact with the ACHD guidelines in some form. So over here is my friend Jim. He's an orthopedic surgeon in town. He's not affiliated with an academic center. And yet he does occasionally get an ACHD patient coming through that'll ping me about. Um, and one of Kim O'Connor, one of our internists, Cedar Cheng, who's uh, one of our high-risk OBs, who's been partnering with our program for a long time. Mark Lewin is the um, chief of the uh, Division of Pediatric Cardiology. And, um, Tim Kirkpatrick runs our echo lab. So these are all people who will interface with adult congenital heart disease patients or providers in our case. And the guidelines have to serve that entire audience. Ultimately, they're obviously serving patients, but not necessarily directly in terms of how we read them. Um, another lesson, recommendations about who should deliver care seem really obvious and were incredibly divisive. So one of the complaints about the 2008 guidelines that lots of people had, especially as an ACHD cardiologist, was it basically said, refer to ACHD, refer to ACHD, refer to ACHD. Um, on one end of the spectrum of who should deliver care was there was a concern that by putting out specifics that we were providing a cookbook for folks who do not take care of ACHD patients to then take care of ACHD patients without the requisite expertise. That was one perspective on one end. The other was, you can't tell us who we can and cannot see. And there was a fair bit of that feedback reflected. And it would seem like to us, it was fairly, you know, to a lot of people, it's fairly obvious. If you've got a patient with a particular disease, they should be seen by the providers who are most expert or trained in that disease. However, when that starts forcing people to shift folks out of their practice, um, when that runs into insurance challenges or whatever, 
Um, one of the things the guidelines reviewers, some of them are very adamant about is that you can't say who should see patients, um, certainly unless there's data and there happens to be data. So there is a study from Ariane Morelli a group in Montreal that looked at the impact of the Canadian guidelines when they were um, released. And then part of their guidelines said refer to an ACHD center and because they have nationalized health care and they had a selection of ACHD centers and the bigger centers, that was actually possible to do. And they were able to mark that as soon as they got a big uptick in, um, in referrals, which happened in the years following guideline, their earliest guidelines release. Um, then they started also seeing a difference in mortality for patients with significant congenital heart disease. So there is some data that at least being seen on an ACHD center with the expertise that entails um, is better for patients. So having folks seen at Yale is going to be better for patients than having them seen in on ACHD populations. And then we have some data as well that um, patients will, overall outcomes are better for patients who are undergoing transplant if they're transplanted at a center who is both a transplant center and an ACHD accredited center. So um, what about Michael? Well, the thing about Michael is in terms of putting in the bar a barrier to care is Michael <laughs> lives really far from us. When I said he came down for his visit, I meant it. He came down from Valdez, Alaska. He actually didn't drive. But just giving the idea of what it would take for him to drive there, it's a couple of days drive through Canada uh, to Seattle. So in Seattle, we serve a geographically enormous area, uh, including Alaska, um, Wyoming, uh, Idaho, and Montana. Um, not at Wyoming kind of as a dealer's choice. They're in the middle of, they're sort of in the middle of nowhere, and therefore they're in the middle of everywhere and can go anywhere they want to. Um, but we primarily are. Um, built and obliged to serve um, Northern Idaho, Montana, and Alaska, who do not have uh, academic medical centers and don't have adult congenital heart disease programs explicitly, although they do have pediatric cardiology programs. So he lives really far away. So this idea of saying, well, an ACHD patient should be seen by an ACHD cardiologist, it might make sense, but it may not be practical. If we don't have that many accredited centers, there are now 30 plus, um, but they are condensed primarily in big metropolitan areas that have medical schools, that can be really challenging for patients, especially if their insurance doesn't allow them to travel. Happens that Alaska's, all the insurers in Alaska um, are quite liberal with the travel and options and they can go anywhere. Um, but they're, it's, it's obviously not that easy for folks to get their ACHD cardiologist. So what did we do? What did, how did that data from Ariane's group really get translated? And it really got translated to say, we have to collaborate and care. We can't say all million and a half patients should be sent to an adult congenital cardiologist when there aren't enough cardiologists, ACHD cardiologists to absorb that. And we don't necessarily have a need to see every one of them, as I'm gonna to get to shortly. Um, or there's plenty of them we could be involved peripherally or you know, in some collaborative uh, modality whereas there's others that we should be primarily following whenever possible. So we really emphasize the collaboration more so than making declarative statements. And one of the reasons we didn't want to make declarative statements is we didn't want to leave people hanging out to dry when they had somebody who, say, presented with an acute cholecystitis and were saying, you can only do operations on patients if you have expertise. And then you're stuck in this, well, is the expertise the more important part right now? Or are we going to have this person have, you know, horrible septic shock from their acute cholecystitis or whatever it might be. So we're trying to really balance the various risks there when we're getting into opinion territory. And so we ended up putting in a lot about collaboration, partly for the systems, but very much for the ACHD cardiologists as well. The ACHD cardiologists have to make themselves available to their group, to their community, and to a broader um, uh, catchment area in really serving in a hub and spoke model um, because that's essentially how this is being developed and that's probably the ideal way to do the care right now. So I am going to get to the um, anatomy and physiology a bit, but that's going to be part of what we were trying to build in for the collaborative care is who really needs to be seen. For Michael's case, he has tetralogy of below. How often does he actually have to be seen? So one of the reasons that the guidelines were revised from 2008 to 2018 is that we actually have learned a lot and we hope and think um, that our patients are better, better for it, better quality of lives, longer lives. 
Um, and so one of the things about this whole guideline process is that you really are trying to balance high quality data against the limited data expert opinion. So we do have a fair number of expert opinions in there, but in this case, relative to the 2008 guidelines, we actually had a lot more of the level B, um, either randomized or non-randomized. Although ACHD is a really large field in terms of the number of patients, it is so heterogeneous. Um, and ASD is not the same as a PSD, is not the same as tetralogy, is not the same as transposition. So trying to do randomized trials is super challenging in this patient population. So we have a lot of level B non-randomized data. Um, but very importantly for us, um, we actually had the first ever an ACHD level A recommendation, which was a big deal. So it's 175 pages with 179 recommendations. They wanted us to do fewer than 2008, which we did, but not by much. Um, the data supplements are huge. There are 90 a, a level of evidence C. So 90 of the recommendations are expert opinion, but the other half are actually supported by data. And that's a very different breakdown in 2008. So it is a field that is continuing to develop data in various iterations, some of the traditional randomized trials that are small um, and others that are more observational. And that actually was, a, we were able to generate data for a few different recommendations. And then our one level of evidence, A, which for a small field like ACHD that's super heterogeneous, seemed like a huge victory. Um, another lesson, one size does not fit all. And this is where, this was one of the things we did in the guidelines that um, is very different than had existed in previous guidelines. And it's a little bit of a playoff of the concepts that were brought out by some of um, the heart failure, uh, ACHD classification from AHA um, to go along with the New York Association class. So historically, adult congenital heart disease care um, of patients have been categorized by the underlying anatomy, which makes a ton of sense. Um, and in underlying anatomy, sometimes it's actually what surgical procedure was used to correct the underlying anatomy. So if you look at these, the things that were deemed simple, by custard valve, small ASDs, VSDs, moderate complexity, tetralogy of flows here. And as I'm gonna show you, that understates what might come up tetralogy of flow. If you look at the greatly complex thing, if these are the ones where the physiology itself is um, challenging. So Fontan procedure is not underlying congenital anatomy, but it is the procedure used to treat single ventricle physiology of all iterations. So that sort of got lumped here as if it was an anatomic thing, which it really isn't, but it does speak to a whole host of underlying anatomies for which um, a Fontan repair ends up getting performed. So if you think back to tetralogy of Fallot here, there is a spectrum of severity that just by saying tetralogy of Fallot is not at all captured. So here's a trio of patients, 22-year-old, asymptomatic, um, normal RV function. That echo actually looks very similar to the to Michael's from earlier. Um, and generally doing well. Pulmonary had a valve sparing repair, doing great. Um, out running around, um, doing a lot of hiking and climbing and backcountry skiing. 40-year-old, abnormal exercise test, a lot of pulmonary regurgitation, free PR right there. A large right ventricle with at least modestly diminished right ventricular function, as, as estimated by MRI. And this is a woman who uh, I met her when she was in her teens, 20 year old, branch pulmonary stenosis, atrial flutter, um, has been hospitalized repeatedly for heart failure. And as you can see on that, that RV barely moves. The LV is completely pancaked. That would be this guy down here. Um, giant right ventricle, right, despite that, generating right ventricular systolic pressures 90 to 100. And she actually died when she was 26 years old. All of these patients have tetralogy of flow. And there is no world where those are all the same patients, similar to somebody who's labeled as heart failure and can have widely disparate severities of disease. So what we tried to capture based on data was, can we do a better job of capturing this physiology, particularly as we're suggesting who should be seen by an ACHD cardiologist or who's gonna require more close follow-up. So the physiologic state incorporated um, features that had data behind them. So in the case of New York Association functional class, um, that actually does have data associated with outcomes for ACHD patients. The one thing that's a little funky, however, is that ACHD patients will disproportionately call themselves functional class one. And when you objectively exercise them, their exercise capacity will be, capacity will be diminished relative to normal. So a lot of folks who say, I am functional class one, since that's symptomatically, um, driven. Um, when you actually go do cardiopulmonary exercise tests on them, 
their exercise capacity will not be normal, which is unusual for the patient population. They've just adapted to what they're capable of doing. So in that setting, we try to capture all of the things that have data and introduce that as a physiologic state. This was actually um, generally really well received by reviewers, although there are a few reviewers who sort of full on hated it. <laughs> but they, when we put it out there, one of the things about the way the guidelines are done now is those can be revised as soon as you have data without redoing the entire, the entire guideline, which is what we did in order to be able to get it. The HA, ACC wanted us to do to be able to get it into the current format. We redid everything even if there wasn't new data. Subsequent iterations will only focus on those things that have new data. So some of these capture things that may seem fairly obvious, like if you have severe pulmonary hypertension or refractory arrhythmias or functional class four, you are not as well as somebody who's functional class one without anything. But there's actually data behind a lot of those. And so they were incorporated into this A and P classification. So the hope here was to say that this tetralogy of flow patient and that tetralogy of flow patient are not the same. ACHD world loves to try out Sean White down there, who is as tetralogy of flow, um, has multiple Olympic gold medals and came very close to doing that yet again in his late 30s. Um, my standing supposition as somebody who snowboards a lot uh, is I don't do that. And so maybe the cardiac pulmonary bypass run made him a little more willing to go tucking himself out of half pipes with all the risks that that entails. Um, and that's quite different than this person up here who has persistent cyanosis uh, and incomplete repair um, and is actually one of our um, works at our hospital in, in radiology. Um, so what we ended up being able to say is that these tetralogy of flow patients shouldn't be treated the same. They are different. And so the physiologic stages, if you can pin the patient into the physiologic stage, it gives you a different idea of how often they should be seen and with what sort of diagnostic treatment so that there's hopefully a little bit more accuracy and a little bit more ability to individualize the care of patients, particularly as we get really to those who don't live near an ACHD center or cooked in with one. And Michael is obviously kind of in between those. Um, although he lives in Alaska, he's actually not a snowboarder, it's happy for him. Um, so what did that actually mean for Michael? There were more robust recommendations regarding the involvement of us in his care. Um, and in general, those with more severe disease, but really, really, really highlighted the need for collaboration rather than simply referral. And that was one good thing that came back to some of the pushback on don't tell us who should see the patient, tell us what to do, um, is just making it, it was really obvious we needed to collaborate as much as anything. But then the other piece that gets to be done with these is, okay, so we have this new AMP classification, does it actually help? And this is a piece where data can influence this going down the road. Um, and these are just a quartet of recent articles looking at the AP classification relative to other classification schemes or the individual pieces that were used to try to say, does it actually help identify patients at greater or lesser risk or does it not? And those are on either side because two of them said it does and two of them said it didn't. So there's still an evolving understanding of whether or not that classification is particularly helpful. I think it's also gonna be something to look at as to whether or not it influences insurers which is absolutely one piece of what we needed is there's too often patients who do need to see an ACHD cardiologist where the insurer does not allow them to do that. One of the hospital systems near us in Seattle, um, we are you know, two miles away from uh, the Providence systems, um, some of the big hospitals, and they do a bunch of things really well. And they have an ACHD program in Spokane that is accredited to partners of ours. They're great but that system is actually initially forcing patients to drive from Seattle to Spokane when there is an ACHD program right across the way. So there are some hopes that some of these classifications, at least they're keeping them in ACHD care, but would also allow patients to do the things that are easier and closer. Um, the obvious thing that I think I keep coming back to is ultimately data does win. So one of the things that comes up with adult congenital heart disease patients is heart failure. It's actually a relatively common reason for hospital stay, particularly as people get older. Um, the whole concept of heart failure syndrome, depending on how you want to define it, um, is something that is a symptomatic experience of many ACHD patients, or at least quite a few ACHD patients. Um, and so therefore should be something that, wow, we should have something to say based on data. It's heart failure, for heaven's sake, heart failure has thousands of pages of recommendations and data. And so if you look at, and this is a slide courtesy of my, my friend Sasha Otoski, um, there, most patients don't have heart failure. Um, who have ACHD, or if those, they do have a heart failure syndrome, they tend to have it for other reasons. So whether that's pulmonary hypertension or valve dysfunction, 
they'll have something that you're going to treat differently. And the treat differently may be that you replace their valve, or it may be that they go on pulmonary vasodilators. And then there is a patient population up here who have kind of classic heart failure syndrome. So what were we able to say? Um, well, when we try to do the dive on the data versus the practice patterns, what's the expert opinion? Well, here's one expert opinion. Frankly, I mess around until they feel better and their BNP decreases. And without destroying their kidneys, then I congratulate myself on the foresight and clinical acumen until they get overloaded again, at which point I blame the nephrologist. And that was one thing we weren't able to do in the guidelines is just kind of write in something, blame the nephrologist. Although my nephrologist, we have a kidney heart service, will happily tell you that we're actually quite good at that whole blaming the nephrologist thing in all of our domains. So that was one, and this is actually a member of the writing committee who <laughs> sent this once we were talking about separately how to manage heart failure. So that is one strategy. The other strategy uh, that we invoked was to use one of these um, systematic reviews. Um, so this parallel process um, with these uh, evidence review committees that were uh, chaired by Ariane Morelli. And they looked at all of the data for systemic right ventricles. So that is a patient population highly unique to adult congenital heart disease uh, with transposition of the great arteries of a couple of different iterations where the ventricle pumping out to the aorta is the right ventricle with the notion that, wow, that can't be awesome. Look at what happens to right ventricles when they have pulmonary hypertension. Um, and surprisingly, I've got 75 year old patients um, with congenitally corrected transposition who are fine. Um, their ventricles are squeezing along great and doing what they want to do. We have others who really suffer with a lot of heart failure. So the systematic review did a dive into what data do we actually have to guide therapy, evaluation of therapy. And the reality is we don't have any data at this point that really allows the guidelines to say explicitly, you should start a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, Entrusto, um, Empagliflozin, that sort of thing. Sorry for the Entrusto, I actually hate brand names. It's a cubitrol all sort and we navigate that on my CC rounds all the time. What are we gonna call that? So Arnie's, um, using Arnie's, using Empagliflozin, any of those, there's just not enough data so that you may be doing that with your heart failure patients, but we were not able to say anything data-driven that would guide you, particularly with patients with systemic right ventricles. So we ended up saying consultation with an ACHD and heart failure specialist is important and relevant to that. Other reasons for heart failure, there is our 1A recommendation uh, regarding bosentin, and that does extend out as a class effect. Oh, the study was on bosentin in Eisenmaker patients. So that's a super niche population, but there actually is mortality benefit from those meds in that patient population. So in heart failure, despite how common it was, we don't have enough data. And so we didn't wander into what, you know, aside from the text saying much about what you can and can't do. Don't stifle innovation. So one of the things you don't want to do with guidelines is say something that's an expert opinion that then is said with such clarity or such vigor um, that people then don't say it. Um, so antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation and Fontan affiliations. DOACs um, certainly were around and heavily studied in AFib when these guidelines were done and written. It was a several year project, um, but there wasn't anything studied in the Fontan population, single ventricle physiology. And there were a lot of concerns about using them, but there wasn't any data. People were like, I think this is gonna be a good idea, but I don't think this is gonna be a good idea. It's not sufficient to actually say, don't use it. You have to have just as many great reasons to make something a level three harm as you do a class one. So a class three. So um, we did not do that. And subsequently, there are ongoing studies, most of them observational, on using DOACs in particular ACHD patient populations. And once we have a cleaner sense of whether or not they're safe, effective, affordable, all of those things, then you'll be able to incorporate that more effectively into the guidelines. And again, either side of this, one says they're fine, the other says maybe not so much. So don't stifle innovation when you're writing these. So that influenced some of the things we didn't say. Um, structural and philosophy can force conflict with strongly held beliefs. So back to our controlology of patients. So a final or a uh, definitive repair, if you will, open the RV alpha tract with a patch, close the VSC. That leaves you with wide open in general. Uh, in pulmonary regurgitation, RV dilation, RV dysfunction, and uh, propensity towards ventricular tachycardia courtesy of the circuit created by those two patches. So definitely not cured, they're repaired. So the question comes up of when do we replace pulmonary valve? Um, 
if you leave them with uh, severe PR, what point are they going to have irreversible permanent RV damage? So what we do know, and one of the reasons I was sort of alluding to the idea that echo isn't perfect, is MRI is quite good at determining RV size and volume and function. So we have a lot of data that if you want your RV to return to a normal size, then you shouldn't wait beyond a certain size in order to, to replace the pulmonary valve if that's what you're looking to achieve. Um, so benefit, there's what you're trying to find is the benefit risk of the early versus late PVR. Um, so if you do it earlier, the benefit of preserving RV function, you may normalize RV size. Um, the benefit though of doing a later PVR is that PVR itself has an increase in the proditis risk. Um, you can have early valve degeneration, so then you're back to doing it again. And there is always a surgical risk, no matter how low, there is still some degree of surgical risk. So the surgical risk has to be offset by some of the benefits. So it's perfect for a randomized trial. It's certainly been done in transcatheter pulmonary valves, um, was a randomized, uh, or was has uh, not randomized trial, has trial data um, as opposed to just practice data, but randomized hasn't really happened. It's not very practical. So when we did the guidelines, we had to go with the data. And the data said that you've, if you're symptomatic, um, then by all means, you should replace the pulmonary valve. But all of the rest of them ended up being a 2A recommendation, not a class one. So everybody's practice pattern is that if somebody's right ventricle is big enough, they'll just replace the pulmonary valve. That's what a lot of folks in ACHD do. And this was interpreted as saying, and as a 2A, interpreted as saying, you can't do that. <laughs> and that's not at all what it's saying. Everybody wants to be robustly told, yes, go do your thing the way you do it and we've got your back. And so class one is the desired, if you will, recommendation. But a 2A is still, it may be reasonable, it's fine. You can do that if it's appropriate to your patient. But the reason for that difference in clinical practice, which aggravated a lot of people, um, is the data. So on vacation in Africa, Pinocchio has this long time wish to be a real boy, suddenly and unexpectedly granted. That is to say, be careful what you wish for. So we wish for a lot of data, but we had a lot of data. And in this case, the data doesn't allow us to just write a recommendation that is the same as what we do in clinical practice. We definitely know that RVs, there's such a thing as too big. Um, and if you wait too long, you're not gonna normalize the RV size or function. Um, what we know is that PVR um, will improve RV size, generally improves RV, uh, albeit not always. And if somebody's near a association class two or lower, it can improve their near a association class. So you can't get better than near a association class one. So that's not gonna, if you're walking in asymptomatic, then you're not necessarily going to benefit symptomatically. PVR does have a mortality risk. And so far, the data does not show that PVR improves mortality in tetralogy patients. There's a lot of things you can do to improve mortality in tetralogy patients. But one of those key things was that VT risk, which may or may not be mitigated by replacing the pulmonary valve. That may be more mitigated by doing an ablation at the time of pulmonary valve replacement, which has been our practice habit for the last 10 years to try to mitigate those two things at the same time. So that made everybody really grumpy to not be able to just say, yes, clearly there is mortality benefit and thus replacing the pulmonary valve at certain markers is a um, class one recommendation. So we have a lot of reasons in here to do it. It actually captures what the pack, uh, um, practice patterns are for most people, um, but it was because it was a 2A, it aggravated folks. One of the key questions we don't know yet, though, is this is all based on the data that we have, which is largely surgical. Six dermotomies over a lifetime, that idea of valve durability becomes really important. But what happens with these transcatheter valves where at a best case, you know, we may be able to do two transcatheter valves. In fact, we have. Um, but if you can do transcatheter valves with a lesser surgical or a lesser mortality risk, then does that change the equation for how we end up saying we really want to be able to help out this right ventricle sooner than we are now? And I think it ultimately will, granting transcatheter valves have a unique endocarditis risk associated. Uh, number 10, interpretations of carefully selected language will still vary. Um, and here's my favorite example of just interpreting things. Eggs are fantastic for a fitness diet. You don't like the taste, add cocoa flour, sugar, butter, baking powder, and cook at 350 for 30 minutes. Voila, our carefully selected language around eggs and fitness diet made much better. Um, by turning into cake or cookie. Um, so atrial septal defect, very briefly, what are the consequences of an ACHD? Uh, right ventricular volume load due to volume coming across at the atrial level, and about 10% of patients who are unrepaired will develop 
pH in response to that volume load for reasons that are um, still being understood but are not direct are not solely related to volume load. Um, treatment of ASD is really safe and effective. Um, you can do it surgically, you can do it with a catheter, it's a very low mortality and a low rate of complications. Um, and patients will feel better. Patients, again, generally do fine. Um, RV size gets lower, PA pressures, if they're elevated, can come down, symptoms will improve. Um, and so this is what the old guideline said. And for anybody who knows me, Rod knows this. Um, I have a tendency to use 10 words when one might have done. And this is exactly an example of here are our guidelines coming out of the 2018. And again, this is largely based on the data available, some of the technologic differences, and another thing based on um, the systematic review. So there isn't a classroom recommendation for just having a big right heart to close the ASD. It is A2A, again, aggravated everybody. VSD and PDA were different, and that just came down to the idea we had mortality data for uh, the LV enlargement of VSDs and PDAs, and we don't have that for ASDs. And that was vetted and done again with one of these systematic reviews. So for anybody who's looking at the ACHD guidelines, those are really worth reading. Uh, they were thoroughly done by people who are really um, incredibly good at what they do, um, and not all are ACHD experts. In fact. Um, so you can't cherry pick was basically the idea, again, the data that suits what you want to do. And that was actually hard for even us as a writing committee to have to really face the idea of like, okay, our practice pattern isn't a class one because we all were doing that, um, but it is a class 2A. So everybody was all enthused about things that are class ones, but grumpy around the idea of the two A's. So it is important to remember these are guidelines, they're not rules. So a 2A says it's reasonable to do, you're not necessarily obliged. Frankly, you're not obliged from class one either, um, but it gives you some sense of what the wiggle room might be, particularly if you're looking at a patient where either, yes, that is the best path for them, or wow, we ought to wait. It'll give you some latitude in there. So guidelines have limitations. Um, as I was telling Rob, I've, I've not been on, on bird trips before, but I've recently gotten to go look at, over the weekend, some different birds. And one of those things is these are all little red birds, but they're very dramatic, they're different little red birds, as I learned over the weekend. And ACHD patients, or all of us, have a lot of super important differences that make us unique um, and that need to be incorporated into our care plan. So here's Chris. And a lot of them are things you will not be able to anticipate. He's 35, he has transposition treated with mustard repair. So he's one of those systemic right ventricles. He tells me he has normal exercise capacity. He goes hiking, he goes biking, he does that sort of thing. And he rode his bike from home to his annual ACHD visit. And that is only remarkable because he lives in Albuquerque. And he drove, he rode his bike. Actually, it wasn't longer than that because he kind of did the scenic thing up through the um, Northern California, Oregon coast, Washington it took him 14 days. And no, he did not ask permission to do this beforehand, um, but he did send us the blog as he was going, which was simultaneously really cool and gave me chest discomfort. <laughs> so there are things that the guidelines are simply not going to ever capture because of the uniqueness of both the patients themselves, how they choose to live their lives. And so you as a cardiologist have to be able to integrate whatever data we have with giving people the freest, happiest lives that they can in terms of both improving their symptoms and letting them go on about their things. And I went over 10 because I'm a Seahawks fan and we like the number 12 a whole lot. So in wrapping the 12, um, I had one thing I really got out of this whole process was an enormous gratitude for my colleagues, my patients and colleagues um, around the country and around the world. It's a field that is growing rapidly from the partnership of both the patients and all those who are invested in the care of those patients, which is really a privilege to be a part of that group. Um, so my therapist told me the way to achieve true root inner peace is to finish my start so far. I finished two bags of M&M's chocolate cake. I feel better already. And I have also finished this brand rounds. And so with that, I will take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much, Karen. That was really interesting. I, I learned a lot about the guidelines. I look at the guidelines a lot. Um, and it's really interesting to see the, you know, how you guys came to them. And so thank you for sharing some of those insights. I'm going to open it up for people if you have questions. Um, I, I thought I would just ask, so you talked a little bit about collaboration, which I think is really important between the specialist and the cardiologist and the internist. And I, I'm 
uh, impressed with your patients that come from all over. When do you think patients should be referred and are patients referred too late sometimes? Like I, I have this conversation sometimes with some of my heart failure colleagues who often say, you know, I wish we had seen patients sooner. So what's your ideal state, especially considering you have patients coming from New Mexico, <laughs> Alaska, come see you so how do you how do you think about I, that? I actually think that they should yes they are referred to like you were completely that's that was it i'll send you the 20 bucks later for that. Um, <laughs> the uh, achd patients are definitely referred to late as a whole to achd cardiologists so there's actually a lot of data for that some of that is the patients themselves they don't know that they need ongoing cardiac follow-up so they don't drive their own care and they will present disproportionately if they've been lost, lost to care what gets them represented is disproportionately acute um, things that land them in the hospital in some cases. So whether it's arrhythmias or heart failure exacerbations that can land them admitted, can land them with urgent or emergent procedures, which is clearly what we're trying to avoid. So the idea, and I didn't talk about transition in here in the perfect world, um, pediatric cardiology ensures a smooth transition to adult congenital heart disease of their growing patients from childhood to adulthood. And the ACHD cardiologists ensure a smooth transition of those patients so that the patients themselves always know that they need to stay tied in with cardiology care, specifically ACHD care, if that's appropriate to their heart disease, which it is for most. And then if they're living somewhere far from the ACHD cardiologist, that they're partners in how to figure out um, how to make sure that they get some of the expert care that they need. Um, and I think that that can be pretty challenging and the majority of our patients didn't have that nice transition. Um, and ended up doing what Michael did, which was graduate from high school, go off to college and sort of forget about the whole thing. Um, and then finally get reconnected, and thankfully in a, an elective fashion. So I think every ACHD patient that somebody sees who has not been seen by an ACHD cardiologist in the intervening year or two with a, you know, unless there's a plan in there from pediatric cardiology, say can be seen in four years, fine. <laughs> but every other patient with ACHD should be seen by an ACHD cardiologist at least once in my opinion, even if that seeing is to have the ACHD cardiologist review, I, you know, either do a telemed or review all the imaging and say, you know, this is a restrictive VSD. The patient's doing fine. They don't need to travel to us, but they should come see us sometime in the next couple of years. So I think every ACHD patient should be seen once if you can, even if it's a virtual weigh-in, um, in order to kind of lay out a, a care uh, plan for them. And we definitely see them too late. There are plenty of patients who have symptoms that we think would have been mitigated by an earlier intervention. And the earlier intervention is something that ACHD cardiology tends towards more so than, um, than folks who haven't seen those patients, including relatively simple things. And Rob can attest to this. We are very about rate, uh, rhythm control in ACHD patients. If they're in an atrial arrhythmia, get them out of it is the first and foremost standing thing. We don't do rate control per se. So we've seen patients who that definitely had um, difficulties with that particular approach because it's what we do in other patient populations, but it doesn't suit this patient population. I'm going to open up. Anyone have any questions they'd like to pose to Dr. Stout? I don't see anything. I have, I have one more quick question. Mm -hmm. Maybe a quick question. What What are your thoughts about workforce in ACHD specialists? And you know, it's a very long training pathway. You mentioned we don't have enough folks to take care of that population. So how do you see that from your vantage? So my vantage point is that the population is definitely too small um, of ACHD cardiologists. There's not enough training. And quite frankly, um, by saying it has to be a two-year fellowship after three years of cardiology, but without any increase in pay. Um, and that's a big deal for people, especially because it has such a big med peds draw. So a lot of the folks who do this um, specialty are med peds um, and then do either pediatric or adult cardiology. And then we say, you got to do two years of ACHD. I think the two years of ACHD is fair game for really understanding the specialty. That doesn't seem, it's really, it's really a year and a half of clinical training and six months of electives. I think having a bulk of your time spent doing that is wise. Um, and it has made it harder to attract people to ACHD because by the time you're done with that, you're gonna get paid the same as you would if you were a general cardiologist or a pediatric cardiologist, general adult cardiologist. So it's a little similar to heart failure in that regard um, in that you do the additional training, but it doesn't necessarily help you pay off your student loans any faster. And in fact, it keeps you at a resident salary. And in some cases, for those of you who don't know this, 
the residency salaries tap out at an R8 level um, in most places. There isn't much beyond that. And so for many of our um, fellows, they're getting paid the same for a couple of years. They don't get an increase annually in their salary because they're getting into our tens pretty readily. And that is a disincentive as well. So I think that is a um, long answer to say the training is too long. It is not going to expand our workforce. Um, I think that having more ACHD cardiologists integrated into different practice groups is ultimately what's necessary to really optimally take care of these patients. So there is going to be a group of, of there's going to be a hub and spoke. But the spoke, ideally, we've had a couple of times where we've had ACHD trained cardiologists in private practice groups that we've been able to partner with, and that has been fantastic. So we need a lot more of that. And I think we get there by uh, in a combination, in a series of moves. One of them is to shorten training in some form. Um, and so the thing that has come up quite a bit is fast tracking, if you will, or the two plus two, two years of general cardiology followed by two years of ACHD. And I've been a noisy voice for that for a while, and that may be coming to fruition um, in the years to come. And then also being able to um, remunerate for the congenital heart disease piece uh, differently um, because it's an underserved population uh, globally and because there is already some built-in things that like ACHD or CHD echoes pay a bit more for the complexity. So there may be ways to attract people to the field that are the practical aspects of life. And then there's just the continued, it's an incredibly awesome discipline, great patient population, really cool physiology. You're learning every single day, no matter how long you've been doing it. So there's that inherent appeal um, that I think can speak for itself once we get over some of the practical limitations. All right, that sounds like a great way to leave it. Thank you so much to Dr. Karen Stout for the wonderful Grand Rounds, and hopefully next time we can have you in person. Oh, it'd be awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks, Rob, for the invitation.